be in John chapter 12. Let's begin in verse 1. Let's talk about get wasted. John chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. The Bible says, Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. Here, a dinner was given in Jesus' honor. Martha served, while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with Jesus. Then Mary took a pint of pure nard, an exceedingly expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth about a year's wages. He didn't say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. You will always have the poor among you, but you will not always have me. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priest made plans to kill Lazarus as well, for on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Let's pray and invite the Holy Spirit to come be with us. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the people you love so much. Thank you for your presence here. Lord, I pray that we would encounter you. I pray we would be in your presence as we receive your word. If your heart agrees with that, would you say amen and amen. amen. My very first job in high school was a stock boy at an auto parts store. And I remember one night that was particularly slow, a couple of the cashiers were talking about a ski trip that they had just returned from. And they said, oh man, we were so wasted. We were wasted the whole time. And then they started reminiscing about this party and about that weekend jaunt into the city. And every memory ended with the refrain, we were so wasted. Finally, I said to them, it sounds as if you're incapable of having fun unless you're wasted. And they looked at me as if I had two heads and they said, well, that's the whole point, isn't it? To get wasted. You know, at the time, I didn't agree with them. But I've actually come to conclude that they were right. The whole point of life really is to get wasted. For the last two weeks, we've been talking about a woman named Mary from the suburb of Bethany. The Gospels give us three snapshots of her life. The first snapshot was at her sister Martha's house. You remember the scene. Martha was serving, but Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to him. And that scene shows us what God values from us. What God values is not our performance, our efforts to please him or impress him, but God values our love for his presence. The second snapshot was Mary grieving at her brother Lazarus' tomb. Mary fell at Jesus' feet, weeping, and Jesus wept with her. And that scene shows us how much God values us. What's more amazing, the man that raised someone from the dead or the God that came and wept with his friends? The final snapshot is back at Martha's house again. And it shows us what it looks like when we value Jesus. Mary was absolutely wasted. Not in the sense of being high or on booze, but in the sense of being drunk in love with Jesus. Mary was wasted in the sense of Song of Solomon. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is more delightful than wine. We rejoice and delight in you. We will praise your love more than wine. Look at Mary. She had absolutely no sense of self-consciousness. She had no inhibitions. She was unreserved in expressing her passion for Jesus. She was oblivious to propriety. She was reckless. 
At a dinner party given in Jesus' honor, Mary rushed in and she broke the seal on a jar of extremely expensive perfume. She poured the whole thing on Jesus' head. The parallel passage in Mark gives us that detail. Uh, imagine this perfume being like the consistency of hand lotion, pink in color, and the most overwhelmingly sweet fragrance that you've ever smelled. It matted Jesus' hair and his beard. It drenched his robe. It soaked into his skin all the way down to his feet. And then Mary did the unthinkable. She let down her hair in public and she dried Jesus' feet with her hair. Mary was wasted. She was drunk in love. She forgot about everything else and everyone else. And Jesus affirms that that's pretty much the point of life, to get wasted. The point of life is to become so drunk in love with Jesus that you can't refrain from expressing it, no matter how much it costs or who's watching. The point is to love him unreservedly. The point is to love him extravagantly, lavishly, generously, sacrificially. The point is to love him all the way, past the point of no return. I would suggest to you that in this story and in the other snapshots of her life, Mary is held up as a model disciple. Every time we see her, Mary is at the feet of Jesus. A rabbi's disciples always sat at his feet to learn. So each time we see Mary, she is in the position and in the posture of a disciple. At this dinner, Mary did everything right that the disciples did wrong at the Last Supper a few days later. When Jesus spoke of his death to his disciples in the upper room, they refused to believe him. They refused to accept it, but Mary had been listening closely to Jesus. She knew what Jesus intended to do in Jerusalem, so she came to lavish this gift on Jesus that became a prophetic act preparing him for his burial. The disciples failed to wash Jesus' feet in the upper room, so Jesus washed their feet and he nudged them to follow his example. But Mary washed Jesus' feet intuitively without being prodded by him. You see, Mary was way ahead, and the twelve were lagging behind, one of them fatally behind. So if Mary is a model disciple, how can we become like her? How can we get wasted like Mary? How can we become drunk in love with Jesus, passionate towards him, unreserved in our expression of worship? Well, we get wasted the same way Mary did. The snapshots of her life, they show us how. How can we get wasted like Mary? One thing I find is by spending time in Jesus' presence. You know, there were many people who spent time in close proximity to Jesus, but not all of them spent time in his presence. Many people attended that first dinner at Martha's house, but only Mary sat at his feet. And it's still true today, there are many people who have come in close proximity with Jesus, but they haven't yet experienced the beauty of being in his presence personally. To be in his presence means that you become keenly aware that Jesus is near you. You know, his presence creates sensations, emotions inside of you, anticipation, giddiness, happiness, loveliness, peace, sometimes just a reverent quietness. The Hebrew word for glory means a weight. And there have been a few occasions that I have experienced God's presence in a sensation of a heavy blanket pushing down on me. And some others have shared that they've had that experience as well, some in our services. In Indonesia, when I was teaching at the School of Acts, we experienced God's presence one morning in a literal physical wind that blew through the room. It actually blew the curtains off the curtain hooks and all the doors and windows were closed. We've had other times that we've experienced God's presence here in the sanctuary as a literal sweet fragrance that many people smelled. 
Other times we've experienced God's presence in visions. I've had all of those experiences, but I want to tell you mostly on a day-by-day basis, it's just a certain kind of joyfulness in my heart that lets me know that Jesus is near. You know, the Bible compares the effect of his presence to the effect of wine. To be in his presence means that your attention becomes keenly focused on Jesus. You fasten your thoughts on him and stop worrying about everything else. You fasten the eyes of your heart on him so that you lose your appetite for everything else for a little bit. You you fasten your spiritual ears on him so that you hear his whispers in your innermost being. While Martha huffed and puffed, Mary was only vaguely aware of her surroundings. She was captivated by Jesus. It's like sitting at a cafe with your lover. And you know that there are other people all around, but they're all what photographers call bokeh. They're all just a blurry background because you only have eyes for the one that you love. Mary sat at Jesus' feet in his presence. And she found peace. In his presence, Mary found affirmation. In his presence, Mary found appreciation and value and worth. She found security. She found a defender from her sister's harsh criticisms. She found someone who understood her quiet, introverted nature and loved her for it. In his presence, Mary found relief from stress and anxiety. Martha was worried about many things, but Mary wasn't. She found relief from the expectations of others, from the pressure to perform. In his presence, Mary found soul satisfaction. No wonder she was wasted. No wonder she was drunk in love. And can I tell you that we can find all the same things in Jesus' presence. And we can be in his presence anywhere at any time. You know, we can be alone in his presence in a crowded worship service like this one. We can be in his presence worshiping or praying at home or in our car or at the office or on our lunch break or enjoying the outdoors. I have been in his presence planting bulbs and pulling weeds in my garden and walking the dog. How can we get wasted like Mary? Another thing I find is by hearing Jesus' heart in his beautiful words. There were many people who heard Jesus' words, but they didn't hear Jesus' heart. They filtered Jesus' words through the grid of their own appetites and ambitions. You know, the twelve were like that at times. Peter didn't want to hear anything from Jesus about the cross. And Jesus said, Peter, you savor the things of men rather than the things of God. Right up until Jesus was betrayed, the disciples were bickering and they were questioning Jesus about positions and rewards. Even John the Baptist sent word to Jesus inquiring why Jesus hadn't freed him from prison. But Mary listened more closely than the most. And in Jesus' words, she discerned his beautiful heart. I am the beautiful shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. No one takes my life from me. I lay it down willingly. The Father has given me authority to lay down my life and to take it up again. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish. And no one shall ever snatch them out of my hand. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, shall never be thirsty. Whoever comes to me, I will never reject. I will never turn away. And I shall not lose any of those that the Father has given me. But I will raise them up on the last day. The rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials abuse their authority. We've seen that, haven't we? But the Son of Man didn't come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Take my yoke, learn of me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me shall live even though he dies, and whoever lives believing in me shall never die. Do you know what Jesus meant by that last line? 
He meant that when we as believers transition from this life to the next, there's never a moment that we're outside of his presence. During that blink of an eye between life on earth and eternity, we don't die, but we remain alive in him the entire time. Mary listened closely and she discovered in Jesus a loving leader worth following. She discovered in Jesus a, a faithful savior worth trusting. She discovered in Jesus a God with a compassionate and a humble heart worth loving. She listened and she found a reason to cling to hope in life. She found a purpose for living. She found wisdom for living. She found faith for eternal life. Mary listened closely and she discovered in Jesus a heart more beautiful, more pure, more noble, more selfless, more loving, more caring, more faithful, more consistent, more giving, more good than any heart that she had ever known before. Mary was captivated by Jesus. She was intoxicated by his beautiful heart. Read the word. Study the word, reflect on the word, pray over the word before you open it. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you to grasp it and to get life from it. Invest a little bit in learning the word. Discover the beautiful heart of God in his word and you will become intoxicated too. How do we get wasted like Mary? Another way I find is by being comforted and helped by Jesus in times of crisis. Mary loved Jesus because he comforted her in her time of need. In her grief, he came to her. He called for her. He wept with her. He reassured her with his promises. He filled her heart with hope. Mary loved Jesus because he answered her prayers. He fixed what was unfixable. He cured the uncurable. He restored what was lost beyond recovery. And Jesus does the same for us. Be in his presence. Discover his beautiful heart and his word. Receive his comfort and help in his time of need and you will become wasted like Mary. Song of Solomon says it this way. My beloved is radiant and ruddy, outstanding among 10,000. His mouth is sweetness itself. He's altogether lovely to me. This is my beloved, my friend. If Mary is a model disciple, how do we become like her? How can we pour out our love for Jesus? You know, the scene at Bethany is not one that we can duplicate. Jesus has gone to heaven. He's taken his seat at the right hand of the majesty. We can't come and pour perfume over his head and his feet. But Mary's perfume represents some things that we can offer to Jesus. See, each one of us has been given our own portion of perfume. You have that little vial we gave you on the way out? I want you to just take it in your hand. Don't open it. <laughs> just hold it for a minute. Each one of us has been given our own portion of perfume. It's extremely precious. It's extremely valuable. It's extremely rare. Once it is spent, it can't be recovered again. And we offer it not just in one dramatic moment, but we offer our perfume day by day by day to him. How do we pour out our love for Jesus? For one thing, by offering him the perfume of our service. You know, Mary wasn't the only one that was wasted at the dinner in Bethany. Martha was pretty wasted too. The perfume that she offered Jesus was her perspiration, her service. After the embarrassing scene at the first dinner, Martha didn't stop serving, but she did get a new attitude. When Jesus told her Mary has chosen what's better, Jesus wasn't saying that serving in the kitchen or serving at the table was a bad thing. It wasn't Martha's service that separated her from Jesus, but it was her attitude. And Martha learned that service can be true worship if it's done with the right attitude. And it's true for us too. Our service can be precious perfume lavished on Jesus when our heart is in the right place. When Mary broke that seal on the perfume jar, the precious contents were poured out irrevocably. 
She couldn't get it back again. And that's just like the precious hours that we spend serving Jesus and serving others for his sake. The hours that you've spent preparing and teaching Sunday school, that's perfume that you can't get back. The hours that you've spent preparing food for someone sick or for a church event or to entertain people in your home for Jesus' sake, that's perfume that you can't get back. The hours that you've spent listening to people, counseling them, praying with them, encouraging them, that's perfume you can't get back. The days that you've spent helping to raise awareness and prayer support and financial support for missions, the vacation time that you've used to go on missions trips, that's perfume that you can't get back. Board meetings and building committee meetings and annual business meetings and leaders meetings, teachers meetings, volunteer meetings, committee meetings. It's perfume that you can't get back. What is your perfume? Your, your perfume is your days. Your perfume is your precious hours. It's your golden minutes. Your perfume is your time. Your perfume is your efforts. It's your talents that you've offered to Jesus. Your perfume is your perspiration for the sake of Christ and his gospel. How can we pour out our love for Jesus? Another way I find is by offering him the perfume of our pure adoration. Mary lavished pure worship on Jesus. Her thoughts were focused on him. Her heart was focused on him. She lavished love and honor and gratitude on him. And the beauty of it delighted Jesus' heart. And it kept on delighting him. You know, all the years that I've read this story, there's something that I never realized. Given the quantity and the quality and the potency of this perfume... This beautiful scent stayed with Jesus for the next six days all the way to the cross. Just a dab of this perfume would have been enough to do it for a night out. Have you ever had a friend who, you know, just overdoes it with the cologne or the perfume? <laughs> Remember those old commercials where the, the, the people in the office could smell their boss coming before he arrived? And... You know, just, just don't open this. Just rub your hands on the outside of it and smell your fingers and, and, and the scent is, is already on you. Sometimes you hug somebody and their scent stays with you for a long time. Had a young guy come to my office once and he was notorious for overdoing it with the cologne and my office smelled like him for days. It was the, his scent was just stuck on my sofa. The, the huge quantity and the potency of Mary's perfume filled the entire house with an overpowering fragrance. And this thick lotion, it was matted in Jesus' hair and in his beard. It was on his robes. It soaked into his skin. And when Jesus perspired in prayer in the garden, that scent was reactivated. When they plucked his beard, that scent was reactivated. When he was lashed 39 times and left bloody and they put his own robe back on him again, that scent on the robe was reactivated. When blood ran from his brow onto his beard on the cross, the scent was reactivated. All the way to the cross, all the way to his last breath, Jesus could faintly detect the lovely fragrance of Mary's worship. And your worship is a perfume that delights the heart of God too. It's a lovely smell that lingers in his nostrils. You know when he just comes across your mind during the day. And all of a sudden for a minute your heart is just filled with gratitude. And you're so thankful to God for your life. And you're so thankful to God for your family. And you're so thankful to God for everything he's done for you. That's perfume. When you crank the worship music in your car. And you sing your lungs out. Even though someone told you you're singing stinks. It's perfume to God. <laughs> When you get that new worship song and you just keep hitting repeat again and again and again and you just keep singing it to the point of tears, that's perfume. When you lift your voice in prayer and you can't even find the right words to express everything that you're feeling in your heart, it's perfume. 
when you're worshiping in church and your heart is so full that you wish you had the feet of a dancer or the fingers of a musician or the voice of a singer or the hands of an artist to express what's in your heart for God in that moment, that's perfume. How do we offer our love for Jesus? Another way I find is by offering him the perfume of our sexual purity. It's hard really to grasp the shock value of what Mary did next. She let down her hair and she used it as a towel to dry Jesus' feet. In Jesus' day and still in many places in the world today, a woman never ever let down her hair. A woman's hair was for her husband to admire alone. The shock value would be about the same as someone coming into our sanctuary and stripping down to his underwear. We actually had that happen once. <laughs> and it was shocking. <laughs> and what's more prized to a woman than her hair? Mary took a part of her body that was highly prized and deeply private and she offered it to Jesus. And we do the same with the parts of our body that are highly prized and private. How do we offer them to Jesus? By not offering them improperly to anyone else. St. Paul said that given all that Christ has done for us, this is our reasonable act of worship, that we offer our bodies to Christ as living sacrifices. Our reasonable worship is that we keep our bodies pure. Your sexual purity for Jesus' sake is perfume. Your abstinence from sex outside of the beautiful covenant of marriage is perfume. Abstinence in your college years is perfume that you can't get back. Abstinence in your young adult years is perfume that you can't get back. Your perfume is honoring your marriage vow, not cheating on your spouse, either through imagination or in fact. And once the strength has gone from your body, that's perfume that you can't get back. How do we offer our love for Jesus? Another way I find is by offering him the perfume of our witness, even when it's risky. I would submit to you that Lazarus was also wasted. Having been raised from the dead, Lazarus was now the star witness to Jesus' ministry. When the people in Jerusalem heard about Lazarus, they flocked to the nearby suburb of Bethany to see for themselves. Apparently, Lazarus and Martha and Mary were affluent and popular because many people came from Jerusalem to mourn Lazarus' death. And this miracle catapulted Jesus to the zenith of his popularity. It was common knowledge that the Jewish leaders had it in for Jesus and now they had it in for Lazarus too. This dinner in Jesus' honor, it was a risky business. It was unwise to attract this kind of attention. Lazarus had only just come back from four days in the grave. I'm sure he wasn't eager for someone to send him back there again. Martha served, Mary worshipped. But what did Lazarus do? He was with Jesus. He associated with Jesus in spite of the risk. He testified what Jesus had done for him in spite of the risk. And your risky witness for Jesus is perfume too. You know, when you admit at work that, yes, you're one of those born agains. Your conversations about how Christ has changed your life, the extra pressure that's put on you because people know that you're a Christian. You tell them that you're a Christian at work, they're going to push you to see if you crack. The teasing that you take, the opportunities that you've been denied, the potential threats from HR, that's perfume that you can't get back. How can we pour out our love for Jesus? Another way I find is by offering him the perfume of our financial assets. Mary's offering was not only symbolically significant, it was an extravagant financial gift. In Jesus' day, wealth was held in hard assets and commodities, gold and silver, jewels, luxury items like precious perfume. Salt was a valuable commodity. Roman soldiers were paid in salt. That's where we get our word salary. It literally means salt money. Livestock, produce. The perfume that 
Mary poured on Jesus was worth 300 denarii or 300 silver coins. 300 denarii was the annual salary of a common Roman soldier. It was also the annual salary of a common laborer in today's economy worth about $30,000. It's likely that Mary inherited this asset from her deceased parents to use as a dowry to secure a marriage. Martha inherited the house and Mary inherited this perfume. This perfume represented Mary's financial security. It represented her opportunity to marry well. It represented her present and future net worth. And she lavished it on the body of Christ. Can I tell you that your giving to the body of Christ is perfume too. Your giving represents time of your life you can't get back. It represents the 40 or 50 or 60 or more hours a week that you work. It represents your perspiration. It represents your stress. It represents your weariness. Your giving represents your net worth. It represents your future financial security. It, it represents a little chunk that you can't get back. It represents your dreams. Your giving to phase two represents an over and above sacrifice to build something that is worthy of Jesus. When King David found the farm where the temple was going to be built, the, offer, Aruna, uh, uh, the owner, Aruna, offered it to David for free. But David said, I will not offer anything to the Lord which costs me nothing. Can I tell you, phase two is our perfume. It represents sacrifices that have cost us something. It represents the biggest, the best quality, the most beautiful sanctuary that we're capable of building here on this spot, all in honor of Jesus. It's a testimony. It's a public statement to Greenwich that God is great and he's greatly to be praised. How can we pour out our love for Jesus? By offering him the perfume of our everything without reservation. Mary brought a $30,000 bottle of highly potent perfume. And she wasted the whole thing on Jesus when just a little bit would have been enough. Just a little bit would have been a good enough gesture. It was so potent that the whole thing wasn't necessary. Indeed, it was too much. Have you ever tried to enjoy a meal while you have a, a sicky sweet smell stuck in your nose and your mouth? Mary could have poured out just a little bit and kept the rest for her dowry, but she gave everything without holding anything back. She gave everything without reserve because she saw in Jesus someone who was worthy of that level of extravagant sacrifice. And it smelled beautiful to Jesus all the way to Calvary. You know, Mary was one of the few disciples that followed Jesus all the way to the foot of the cross. And standing there, her hair and her hands and her clothing were saturated with the same beautiful scent that was on Jesus. The smell that was on Jesus was on Mary. Her love matched his worth. And let that be our story too. That we offered all of ourselves without holding anything back from him. All of our love, all of our devotion, all of our loyalty, all of our obedience, all of our worship, all of our days dedicated to him, all of our dreams surrendered to him, all of our plans submitted to him, all our hopes in him, all of our work as unto him, our mind and our body kept pure in honor of him, all of our finances regarded as coming from him and belonging to him all of our perfume because we see in him someone who is worthy of it all. Amen. That's how we get wasted like Mary. That's how we pour out our love for Jesus like Mary. But you know, just like with Mary, not everyone in our orbit will appreciate it. Worship team, you can come help me. People who are wasted 
are uninhibited, aren't they? They're unrestrained. And people who are not wasted are disgusted by the behavior of people who are wasted. Mary was wasted. Martha was wasted. Lazarus was wasted. Just about everyone in the room was wasted. But Judas was not wasted. And because he was not wasted, he was disgusted. Judas was a follower of Jesus who wasn't in love with Jesus. Funny thing that, isn't it? That someone could be a follower and not in love. Judas had been in close proximity to Jesus, but he didn't savor the delight of being in the presence of Jesus. He heard the words of Jesus, but he never learned the heart of Jesus. He didn't see the beauty of Jesus, nor the value of his mission to save people from their sins through his cross. Judas was disgusted by Mary's display of adoration. He was disgusted by her devotion, by her passion, by her impropriety and worship. He was disgusted by her excessive financial sacrifice. Over in the corner, he sneered, what a waste. Do you know that the greatest resistance that you'll face in following Jesus is from those who are followers but who are not in love with him? They will sneer at the perfume of your time that you offer. They'll sneer at the perfume of your purity. They'll sneer at the perfume of your risky witness for Jesus. They'll sneer at the perfume of your giving. They'll say, what a waste. Just a little bit, it would have been enough. You see, when you don't really love Jesus, 30 minutes a week in church is more than enough. When you don't love him being sexually active with someone that you say you're committed to, it's enough. When you don't love Jesus, $5 or $10 in the offering plate, it's enough. Slow down now. Take it easy. Pace yourself. Be reasonable. Followers who don't really love Jesus will sneer at your passionate worship of Christ. They'll say things like, if you really want to do something noble, be socially active, help the poor. But the truth is their ethically impressive words are just a cover for their own inner depravity. Mary's extravagant devotion drew out was what was really inside the heart of Judas and ours will too. The Gospels make it clear that Mary's lavish gift was the final straw that pushed Judas to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. Coincidentally, 30 pieces of silver was the price set by Moses for the value of the life of a slave. In today's economy, it was worth about $600. You see, followers who don't really value Jesus will trade him easily for things of little value. They see in him no more worth than the value of a slave. And listen, here's the thing. In the end, everyone's perfume gets wasted. In the end, everyone's days and hours and minutes expire. In the end, everyone's strength and vitality diminishes. In the end, everyone spends their money on something. And whatever's left over, we can't take with us to the other side. And your ungrateful kids will blow their inheritance in less than 12 months, statistics say. In the end, each one of us will stand before the Lord and only those things that we did as unto the Lord will retain any value for eternity. Only those things that we did out of love and devotion for Christ. Only those things we did out of loyalty and obedience to Him. Only those things that we did out of service to His body on earth, His church will last and everything else will be wasted. In the 1950s, a missionary named Nate Saint was martyred in the jungles of Ecuador at the age of 32. He was a brilliant student and when he told people he was going to the mission field, they were disappointed. Before he died, he wrote this. People ask us why in the world we waste our lives as missionaries. They forget that they too are expending their lives. And when the bubble has burst, they will have nothing to show for the years that they wasted. 
his fellow missionary and martyr, Jim Elliott, wrote this. He is no fool who gives up that which he cannot keep in order to gain that which he cannot lose. Judas saw in Jesus nothing of real value, so he traded him for $600. But Mary saw in Jesus the most beautiful thing she had ever seen, and she lavished on him a gift of perfume worth $30,000 that delighted him all the way to the cross. When the worth of Jesus and the love of his followers match, it's a beautiful thing. My prayer for you during this season of Lent and beyond is that you'll get wasted like Mary and that you'll pour out your love for Jesus like Mary. My prayer for you is that Jesus will become your magnificent obsession.